Hello everyone, this is part one in a series of new videos based on this book by Sven Brinkman. The book is titled Qualitative Inquiry in Everyday Life, Working with Everyday Life Materials. Sven Brinkman is a Danish psychologist, social scientist more generally, concerned with philosophy of science, philosophy of psychology, the nature of psychology. He has a relatively well-known book titled Psychology as a Moral Science, where Influenced by Alistair McIntyre and Rome Hari and a few others, he argues in favor of seeing psychology not as morally neutral, but as a project that is supposed to aid the development of uh, uh, moral development of of humans, not as something that not as a as a discipline that is concerned only with collection of facts. In this book, he is um, doing something interesting. In, uh, with respect to methodology. And my, my method, I'm going to experiment with something different in, the, in this series of videos. Uh, but before getting into that, let's take a look at the, the structure of the book, the table of content on the left side. We, have, uh, we can see that the book is divided into part one and part two. Each part has multiple chapters. Um, part one is more preparatory, is more general, some general arguments about what he what he wants to develop, the argument in favor of using what is accessible in everyday life and using that everyday observation, what we are already observing in our day-to-day -day experience. The ethics related to that, epistemological questions. And then in part two, he turns into specific fields of, uh, of human life, talking about how we can bring research into that area. We can bring a researcher's mindset and you can kind of see appreciate how there, there is no clear boundary between being a, a researcher being somebody who is interested in psychological research or philosophical research and somebody who is just living a human life now my method in, in this series is going to be like like this I, i'm going to focus on a chapter at a time and i'm going to go through a chapter and then i'm going to highlight key passages from the chapter and then read these highlights together with you and as you're watching you're going to see the passages too so it, it will be clear when i am coding and when i'm adding my own commentary in this part i'm going to begin uh, just talking about introduction and the subtitle for introduction is making less more so let's begin i'm gonna click on the flash cards which i've already made 28 cards means 28 places where I have highlighted <laughs> things that uh, Brinkman has written. One last thing I should say, the book was published in 2012. All right. The first quote is, uh, it says, Although hostility towards qualitative inquiry still exists here and there, not least in my own field of psychology, qualitative methods are now, uh, are now broadly accepted. This is a good thing, but it sometimes leads to what may be called methodolatry, or a worship of method at the cost of careful theoretical and conceptual reflection. So what he calls methodolatry could be putting the method above everything else, putting the method above uh, or prior to research question, prior to material, prior to, to phenomena of interest. But methodology can show up as a result of not worshipping a method, but, but just being mindless, not being reflective enough, and not realizing that method is something that can develop in parallel. We, we, don't have to, we don't have to wait until we have a method in place before we start doing it, we start engaging in a research project. Um, and a more personal observation is that in, in departments of psychology that I, ha I have worked usually there is there has been hostility towards towards qualitative methods but of course that's not widespread there are there are many departments many universities where psychology has been associated with qualitative research but there's even in those departments there is an advantage there's an institutional advantage and bias in favor of quantitative methods next we see this for example in some of the current methods books that aim to sell some research method 
wholly disconnected from the theoretical considerations about the nature of the subject matter. So this uh, refers to a methodology that he just talked about. Some method books aim to sell some research methods. So a method book that is that calls itself, uh, let's say, phenomenological research in psychology. That kind of project can be overly strict and overly focused on method and at the cost of losing theoretical consideration. So next, I'm often led to wonder how methods are supposed to make sense in abstraction from an understanding of the subject matter to which they are applied. That's a good point. The popularity of qualitative research methods has also led to a certain inflation of qualitative research projects that grow in scope with more and more participants. This book counters both these tendencies from the perspective that less can be more in qualitative inquiry. So the problem can arise out of uh, this desire to have an industry, have a research industry, layers and layers of machinery, you know, like an assembly line. A uh, person wants to present their research project as very labor intensive. They want to justify recruiting research participants, PhD students, maybe even postdoctoral fellows, and uh, collaborations across institutions and collaboration in, with industries and so on and so forth. So they want to, it, there might be that desire to expand and grow to uh, you know, have a very large research project that is qualitative. So that, that's what the in, this inflation is about. But this book wants to go into the core of, the, to the essence of qualitative research and show that he wants to show that it is not about the size of the data <laughs> that researchers want to collect. In general, too much time is spent on accumulating material too little time is spent on theoretical reflect reflecting upon and writing about the concrete details of what has what one has observed. So I see this clearly in uh, the PhD students that I, I have observed in my own department at the University of Macau. Research students who are just constantly rushing from place to place, back and forth, collecting data, adding material to their existing database. This book aims to make qualitative inquiry possible in a busy life of research and learning. It is meant to, as a survival guide for students and researchers who would like to conduct a qualitative study with limited resources, time and money. Okay, fine. I mean, I, I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't, I don't see this as the most important part of the book for me. I think the most important part of the book is that it's what, what it demonstrates about the, the practice of qualitative research, the connection between philosophy, social science, and everyday life. That connection for me is most important. But of course, I, I also sympathize with the practical side of it. The book suggests that a way forward is to use everyday life materials such as books, television, the internet, the media, and everyday conversations, situations, and interactions as topics for qualitative analysis. As living human beings in cultural worlds, we are constantly surrounded by data, data that we don't notice necessarily, we don't acknowledge immediately as, as research-related data. Uh, so technically, he wants to refer to it as data that, co that call for analysis and as we cope with the different situations and episodes of our lives, we are in fact engaged in understanding and interpreting the world in ways that are always already qualitative forms of inquiry. We tend to forget that there are extremely rich sources of data in our everyday lives and that a disciplined awareness of these sources can lead to insightful analyses of our social and personal processes. So there's a mindfulness aspect. There's a mindfulness training to this. Not realizing that research is not something that always has to happen when you physically transport yourself somewhere else. You, know, you don't have to go somewhere else to get the data from that other special other place. That you can turn everyday material and see the otherness to, in, in what is already in front of us. The book is thus written for novices and experienced researchers alike who would like to look carefully at materials from their own life in order to be able to understand the larger social world. Using parts of 
your everyday life in qualitative research project can make idle activity uh, activities professionally useful and this book will provide you with arguments in favor of doing so and tools for how to do it as you live your life you stumble upon a problem or a situation that surprises you or makes you worry so something that is emotionally salient to not just epist- epistemically salient but is emotionally salient this book argues that such situations are often very useful as occasions for qualitative inquiry that may not just enable you personally to get a clearer view of what surprised or worried you but which may also throw light on larger social issues as these are reflected through your life qualitative researchers can read this book with this in mind the central message of this book is that high quality research is not antithetical to small scale inquiries. So small scale inquiry doesn't mean low or high quality research and large scale inquiry doesn't mean low or high quality research. All those four possibilities uh, can happen. They're all possible. <laughs> One cannot learn a way of working without being presented with examples of possible end results of one's efforts. So that's why he has included those five chapters with specific domains of research and examples observing and analyzing our everyday lives for research purposes is something most people can learn to do quite well what brings rigor and scientific quality to small scale projects is a disciplined and analytic awareness informed by theory theories in the human and social sciences are tools that enable us to understand and cope with the world so even when we are dealing with everyday material, everyday material that are accessible to researchers and non-researchers, what is perhaps special about researchers is that they are informed by some some kind of theory that is then in exchange, in dialogue with their with the material. Theoretical concepts are sensitizing instruments. They sensitize us. They are instruments for sensitization. To borrow a term from Herbert uh, Bloomer, that we use to help us look in fruitful directions and helpful ways. A fundamental assumption of this book is that there is no clear difference between doing a research project and living a life. Not because a life is or should be a dry, mechanical, and methodological affair, but because qualitative research can be lively, engaging, and existentially important. So here, when I was reading these passages, I was reminded by another book uh, by Sam Rocha, called Folk Phenomenology. Samrush's body of work so far is quite sympathetic with this approach, especially Folk Phenomenology and the the forthcoming book on philosophical research and education. Um, Okay, Tim Ingold, uh, 2011, said the following. He said that an intellectual craft is a practice that involves the whole person continually, continually drawing on past experience as it is projected into the future. And this is from a book about, I think it's, it's uh, called On Living or On Being Alive, and then Essays on Movement. And uh, I'm sorry, I don't remember the exact, but the exact title of the book, but it's Ingold, Tim Ingold. The twin skills of observing and writing about the intersection between one's everyday life and the larger social world are best cultivated together. So this is the idea that of course, it is everyday material that we are beginning our research with. We are in dialogue with some theory, but we start with something that is, at, at least in the beginning, personal. It is related to you. That's how you come across it. You come across the material because it is part of your, indirectly or directly, part of your personal life. But being part of your personal life also means that it is part of the larger social world. And your personal life is a way of sampling that not necessarily representative of the majority, but it's in some ways part of a, part of a bigger picture. So it's not just a doing research with, with material, personal material, everyday material, it doesn't mean just autobiography. There's a risk, however, that, oh, this is exactly that point. This, there, there's a risk, however, that this leads to overly confessional and personalized reports that are not always interesting or enlightening for readers. This book advocates keeping a clear focus on what everyday life materials can tell us about our social worlds. Um, I am more sympathetic to just letting the data be generated 
and later on you don't have to always throughout this kind of project always have concern with the social implication of the of the personal personalized or conventional reports uh, but he's he's advocating a more responsible a more responsible approach throughout the whole process okay this was i highlighted this even though it was a title of a sub a subheading of this chapter qualitative inquiry as empirical philosophy so this highlights the relationship between the empirical side and the theoretical conceptual side um, of work both related to philosophy and qualitative inquiry it's a connection between the two human life as such is a research process a hermeneutic process of inquiry that makes it possible to draw a line uh, sorry makes it uh, impossible to draw a line between doing research and being alive. Okay. The present book is not built upon methodological rules as such, but rather upon a philosophical anthropology, that is, a philosophically informed perspective on human being as fundamentally interpreting, inquiring creatures for whom social science is simply a condensed or crystallized form of the everyday activity of understanding one's life in a social world. Empirical philosophy breaks down the boundaries between traditional philosophical work that deals with purely theoretical and conceptual analyses on the one hand, and the empirical sciences that study concrete objects and phenomena on the other. Qualitative researchers should think of themselves as crafts craftspersons uh, who engage creatively with the material and should not be rigid methodologists who mechanically follow predefined steps. Now, this is talking about the forthcoming chapters that we, we will talk at, at length about. The five sources that structure the chapters are self-observations, chapter four, everyday conversations, chapter five, media material, including social media, chapter six, movies, television, and other images, chapter seven, and finally, books of fiction, chapter eight. All right. This was just an introduction uh, to the book. If you're interested in getting uh, in depth into the, and reading alongside with me, uh, feel free to get a copy of the book. It's available as a, as an ebook on Kindle. That's how I'm reading it. And it's uh, quite handy because I can uh, use the highlight function and then flashcards. All right, so in the next part, um, I am going to turn to chapter one, qualitative research and everyday life. Thank you.